Thank you for downloading this edition of Start the Week with me, Anne McElvoy. Hello. We're a rational bunch here on Start the Week, did you ever doubt it? But from the creep of yellow fog in a Victorian thriller to a pulsating light in the evening sky unaccounted for by the Met Office, many of us thrill to the chill of the unexplained. The appetite for ghost stories and grisly murder mysteries persists, despite all those newfangled experts who can explain at least most paranormal and homicidal goings-on. So, around the table, in a seance-like formation, as it happens, I have four people who deal with the downright disturbing as part of a day job. Val McDermott is writer of crime fiction and a new non-fiction book, Forensics, The Anatomy of Crime. Susan Hill is the best-selling author of a wide range of books, including ghost stories such as The Woman in Black and now Printer's Devil Court. Alex Werner is Head of History Collections at the Museum of London, which has a new Sherlock Holmes exhibition, The Man Who Never Lived and Will Never Die. And David Clark is Journalism Lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University and author of Britain's Extraordinary Files. Val, when it comes to crime fiction and often to real crime, we seem to expect forensic science to have the answers. Is that what you found as you researched your book? I think the, the the obvious answer is, in a sense, yes, because the, the the science has moved forward tremendously in the last 25 years. Uh, every week, it seems, there's new developments in one branch or another of forensic science that renders explicable that which was inexplicable. It, it renders uh, analysable that which was previously a mystery. Often, uh, while I was researching this book, I, I came across con- had conversations with forensic scientists uh, where what they were telling me seemed almost like magic. Often it's because we don't really know the, enough about the science as lay people. But sometimes even when you know a bit about the science, it does seem extraordinary, like magic. So I guess in that sense, we've become much more competent at analysing the material that you find at a crime scene. So we expect consequently that much more from the scientists. You do make it sound very, well, forensic, but reading your book, I I was struck by the fact that you have to accept a good deal of the grisly in with the science in order to really want to know about it. Uh, I now know, for instance, that maggots can uh, devour a human corpse, I think 60% of a human corpse, in an incredibly short space of time. So you have to really be prepared to get into that nitty-gritty. And What is it that attracts you to that? Well, I think if you're interested in why we commit the kind of crimes we commit, uh, I think one also wants to be able to figure out how we explain those crimes and how we at least solve them and then make it possible to explain why we commit these things. So in order to solve them, you have to be willing to engage with the raw material, if you like, and the raw material is, by definition, often very grisly. And, and very insect-based as well. We, we do get to know <laughs> I, I didn't an know awful much lot about that. entomology, which I, is my new specialism after reading your book. I didn't know much about entomology when I, I started working on the book. I mean, I knew that there was the science of forensic entomology and I knew it was uh, important in laying down parameters of, of time of death. But I had no idea the, the complexities and the extent of it and the fascination of it indeed. Uh, until I met Martin Hall at the Natural History Museum, who is a man with huge passion for his subject. Who follows clues through the the behaviour of insects around dead bodies. There's also some showmanship involved here, though, isn't there? It it lends itself to a a kind of drama. There's an early example from China of... of, Well, you you tell us. Well, this is is actually one of the earliest uh, examples we know of forensic science. Uh, It was a handbook that was produced for coroners in China in the 12th century. And one of the case studies in the book uh, involved uh, a a man being murdered. Uh, It was fairly evident quite quickly that the murder weapon was a sickle. The coroner could tell this from the the shape and angle of the cuts. Um, But nobody knew who had committed the murder. So the the coroner got every man in the village who possessed a sickle to to line up, put their sickle down in front of them. And as he watched, uh, a fly came along and settled on the blade of one of the sickles. And then other flies joined it. So there was a veritable buzzing cloud of the kind of flies that are attracted by dead bodies. So although the murderer had attempted to cover up his crime by washing his sickle, the traces were still there enough for a fly. They can smell things at an extraordinary distance. When you handle forensic science in your fiction, I suppose, especially knowing what you know now, what are the challenges of of doing that so that it's credible but doesn't just doesn't lead you into a long string of kind of regressive science that only the very informed could follow. Well, I think what you have to always remember when you're writing fiction, that the technology has to be at the service of the story. In a, in a, in a novel, 
it's the characters who who drive the story and and the tension of the story has to, has to go with the the relationship you need to have with the characters the technology the science is only ever at the service of the story if you fall in love with the science and make the book about the science it dates very quickly because particularly at the moment the science is moving forward so quickly but then isn't it tempting to set your books further back when you don't have so much of a, a problem with all these nifty forensic scientists and brilliant entomologists working out exactly what which beetles turned up when and it is the case that the, the history mystery has has really uh, risen to the to, to great preeminence in recent years. Many, many more people are writing their books set in an era before we had any respectable forensic science at all. And there's quite a few of us who are also using the, the idea of the cold case investigation, applying contemporary forensics to cases that were intractable at the time when they first occurred. Susan, the difference, I suppose, with that form of mystery writing and the ghost story, or one of the genres in which you specialise, is that generally with a ghost story, we, we know who did it, or roughly who did it, but it's the implication that matters and the consequence, isn't it? Yes, and it's not just who did it. Um, as, as Val was saying about crime, it's not, not the who, it's the why. Um, the why is the most interesting fact of all, I think. Um, with ghosts, ghosts are quite different. But it's interesting that I was, um, as I was listening to, to Val, I was remembering being on this programme a couple of years ago um, with a physicist from my old college, King's in London, who was working on, uh, oh, some abstruse area of physics to do with materials and how they um, are made and unmade, and I, I don't know the science. Um, and as he was talking, I said something like, well, what about ghosts? And he said, oh, ghosts. Ghosts are absolutely fascinating because they're perfectly possible. And there was a very, very um, rationalist, a scientist, saying, oh, yes, and time and what's all that. And I found that very exciting. Very reassuring for someone very who writes stories. Uh, uh, yeah, stories. absolutely, yes. It isn't like crime, I mean... But do you like the ghost story because forensics don't largely figure. Yes. You don't have to go there. No, no, no. It's, it's fa exactly. It's fantasy, really. It's fantasy and it's fun. Um, and I know the only, the serious part of writing the ghost story is that I want to know why, if there is such a thing as a ghost, why it's there. And most real ghost stories, as it were, um, are rather uninteresting because there seems to be no reason why they should float up and down these staircases. I think we might revisit your spectres in, in, in a moment. Alex, how advanced was forensic science when Arthur Conan Doyle was writing his well, little-known Sherlock Holmes stories? Um, well, it was just beginning, really, then. Uh, the Metropolitan Police Force in London had been established, but they weren't that good at solving crime. And I think um, Conan Doyle um, saw a gap in the market because he was a medic, so he had a good understanding of sort of scientific techniques, and he had a sort of uh, sort of eureka moment, I think, when he realised that he could bring his um, scientific background to meld it into the detective. And it was something quite new. There were earlier precursors like uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. That's really seen as mm. the world's first detective story. That's what people claim anyway. Um, but I think it was a moment when he really, he, he sort of saw that there was a possibility for this new type of detective. And the new type of detective who would be a bit cleverer than those who were fumbling around in the, in the early days of forensics. Yes, I think that in the in the in the short stories that um, developed from 1891 onwards, there all there are mysteries, but there are also adventures, and I think it's that that balance between the mystery element and then the feeling that you're being taken on a journey through the little story, with usually a denouement at the end, an exciting reveal. Mm. They they were they were very very clever little stories, which which I think really gave the genre a new 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 way forward. David Clark is our resident expert on, on the X-Files and all this fabulous sort of epiphenomena and a friend told me and a friend of a friend saw this strange light in the sky. How subject are these beliefs to advances in science? Um, well... They're quite hardy, aren't they? They are, yeah, because this idea... I remember reading Keith Thomas's book when I was at school that said uh, Religion and the Decline of Magic that said, you know, the ghost story is over and nobody believes in them anymore. And yet, you know, when I looked in the Mass Observation Archive... You know, in the 1940s, back in the um, time of the Second World War, um, I think there was um, they found that something like what, uh, 
quarter of the population were saying that they'd had some kind of uncanny experience. So I think it's something that's hardwired into the human brain, you know, that we want that mystery, we want that sort of uncanny sort of atmosphere. It's quite folkloric, isn't it, to the extent that it is linked to other things that are going on in the society very Exactly, strongly. yeah. I mean, it's like during the First World War, there was this great outpouring of sort of, you know, the sort of spiritual beliefs and, and, and this belief in the angels of Mons that was massive in the, uh, in the in the 1915. Everyone believed in it. It was almost Who reasonable. The soldiers on the battlefield. Yes, exactly. These, these were visions that yeah. supposedly um, saved the British army from the Germans in the first battle of the war. But that's extreme circumstances mm. coming into play, isn't it? So it is. Like, psychologically. Uh, Susan, if we just pull up our chair around the fire this morning for a moment... It, tell us a bit about Printer's Devil Court, because what struck me reading that, this is the guess, story that, that you have out at the moment, is the atmosphere is almost like you know, sort of three main characters, but it's almost the fourth character in the book. Oh, yes. Atmosphere, weather, sense of place... Um, those are, to me, absolutely essential, both writing them particularly and reading them. Um, it's the one, I think, the one ingredient that you know I love um, using. Um, I have atmos- to ask you, are you like a, a, a seasoned chef who thinks you know it's going to be one part atmosphere to one part <laughs> weather, to three parts? Of somebody would just describe the the, the, word, the sort of sense of period that you evoke in this book. It's roughly Edwardian as as hill time in the sense that we don't know precisely when it was, but gosh, we feel that chill of the lanterns. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, I was I was looking at the um, the Sherlock Holmes book, and a lot of the there was terrific photographs in there, and lots of the wonderful pictures. I thought, oh yes, this is it. This is where I was. This is where I'm going next. It really is. It, it, it it's. It gets you. And I think the story always comes a little bit later with me rather than the atmosphere. It's a little bit like, you know, in in a more um, literary novel, Thomas Hardy believed that places affected people from the time they were born, especially if they always stayed in that place. I believe that too. You are partly formed by the place in which you grew up. And I think it's, it's the same. It's so important. But what are the constraints? And in this book, we have elements of the paranormal. We have elements of science or pseudoscience, depending on your view of these things. How far can you push that? Or are you aware that there's almost a, a point when, beyond which the reader will say, I simply don't believe that? It will collapse. It's so like you've a got souffle. to, the one thing you've got to do is suspend your reader's disbelief. If you haven't done that, if they're questioning all the time, oh, well, that couldn't possibly have happened. Rather like I feel about UFOs. God knows what people see, but I don't believe it's um, little sources from space. Um, I think that if you don't suspend your reader's disbelief by the fireside in in the room with the curtains rustling a bit and the wind blowing outside, then you haven't done your job. And what you were saying... Something like printer's devil court. I mean, printer's devil... A concrete phrase you know, from from the printing industry, but you help us, don't you, from the beginning to suspend our disbelief because you kind of tell us to enter this world in which something yeah. that is solid actually is going to be a metaphor. Oh yes, and um, a printer's devil was a printer's um, apprentice, um, and it's a it's a wonderful phrase. There used to be a pub called the Printer's Devil when I was an undergraduate in in the corner of Fleet Street, um, and all those old corners, alleyways, squares, you've only got to think about them and they lend themselves to the ghost story. I mean, I started Add a mortuary there. and you're pretty much home and dry. Van, yeah, you're well, have dying to come in on this. <laughs> I think actually that the, the crime novel in particular is, is, is a great utiliser of the sense of place and I think it's actually one of the tricks in the writer's toolbox is that the, the, the authenticity of the sense of place. Everybody knows that, that crimes aren't solved by detectives in the way that we write about it. Everybody knows that's not the reality. It's not a, a grumpy detective inspector with a sidekick who buys the drinks. Uh, It's a whole team of dedicated people doing often very, very boring things, which wouldn't make very good fiction. So we need to take the the reader on this journey of suspended disbelief. And one of the ways we do this is by anchoring it very solidly in a real landscape or in a landscape that feels real. And then the reader reading that thinks, she's telling me the truth about Edwardian London or she's telling me the truth about contemporary Edinburgh Mm. or I've been to a place in Derbyshire just like this. And immediately they're much more inclined to come along with you on the rest of the improbable things you're telling them because you've told them the truth about something so tangible they think she must be telling me the truth about everything else. Strangely, lots of things strange on the programme today, but this also seems to apply, David, when you look at your research on the government's secret files, on the paranormal, People often associate things like a sudden drop in temperature, something quite concrete that you can prove happened 
with extraordinary events. Yeah, I mean, you've got, got to be said, there's a, there's a vast difference between the literary ghost story and people's actual experiences, because the literary ghost story has evolved over the centuries, and it, it needs to have those denouements and, you know, a, a, an ending that sort of chimes with the reader. Whereas you, when, what you find when you actually look at people's experiences that very few ghost experiences resolve in that way. And I think, I think like Susan referred earlier, what we get today are purposeless ghosts. You know, the, the stuff we read about in the tabloids, you know, the sort of... <laughs> purposeless yeah, ghosts, as opposed to a purposeful one. <laughs> white ladies who just sort of vaguely wander across roads in front of motorists and sort of things in houses, that kind of thing. And when you actually interview people... Um, Gillian Bennett, who's a colleague of mine, a folklorist, she, she spent um, did a PhD on this, and she interviewed, I think, several hundred people who came into a, into a podiatrist surgery in Manchester about their weird experiences, and not one of them was anything like what you get in the literary ghost story. They were all sort of, you know, sort of dead relatives coming back to comfort people, and like I say, things in houses and uncanny. That's a more personalised ghost yeah, it service, is, that it is. isn't it? It really? is, but all those things that provide the, um, you know, the, the, the meat for... I think ghosts need us, don't yeah. they? I, last weekend, read something like a 100, inverted commas, real-life ghost stories, and I got so bored because there wasn't a single point in any of them. They were all purposeless. And where's yeah. the story in that? We, we have to take over and, and then create a, a story and an atmosphere out of it. Is that how you go fishing, if? For ideas, you see uh, if, if Mrs. Smith uh, had well, an interesting I I haunting. Was, but actually, there wasn't a single idea in it. <laughs> so but no. it's interesting you mentioned the idea because uh, tell a, a little bit more, if you could, about Printer's Devil Court. I mean, mm. here we have it's this borderline, isn't it, of science, uh, medicine, the great advances in medicine, keeping people alive. In this case bringing people back from the dead that, that sparks the, the yeah. whole journey of the book. You might think that we don't do that kind of thing anymore. These guys want to raise somebody from the dead and they begin by asking one another rather tentatively do you think this is possible look at the gospels look at the raising of lazarus is this possible were these just fantasies and from there they go to concocting um a means they think of ra raising somebody who is obviously clinically dead and their doctors they know back to life and they've been working on this for quite a long time and I think this was as you say Edwardian times we, we wouldn't do this now because this because science is, is so very advanced you couldn't con people like this any longer but by complete fluke I was listening to a radio program about an American uh, evangelist one of the rather more way out types who absolutely categorically stated that in his church people had been raised from the dead and so I, th I thought well maybe this is not something just of the past any longer. Maybe there still are these people. Well, I think the atmospherics, obviously, are very much of the past with these mysterious gases. I mean, you probably couldn't fool people now. No, with, of course with, you couldn't. With, mysterious with gases. gases. But and... I think what is interesting is that question of when does death occur is really back on our kind of ethical spectrum and how we respond to that. So in a sense, that yeah. it, it's an, an abiding and one of fascination. Them, of, one of the doctors, of course, really um, thinks it's absolutely wrong because we don't know enough and we shouldn't tamper and perhaps these people weren't dead. He's much more rational and sane. Alex Werner, The Man Who Never Lived, that's the title of, of your Sherlock exhibition uh, and the book that goes with it, and yet here at roughly the same period you managed to fill an entire exhibition with artefacts that suggest that he did live. Are we being subjected to a Conan Doyle slate of hand once again? Well, in the uh, late 19th century when the stories came out, uh, people were they did believe that Sherlock Holmes was a real person. They were writing in. They were asking um, the publishers for Sherlock Holmes's signature and things like that. So, we, as we were talking earlier, the realism of those stories was obviously very profound for those for those readers. And I think all the way through the history of um, those stories, there is a the real the the realism of the stories is is very important. Um, but in terms of him being immortal. There is an element also in Sherlock Holmes, just his his the way that he's kept going through the years. Now, there there's is, an example of someone who's back from the dead about every five years on you know, BBC and at a cinema near you. <laughs> but, yeah. but but the, but there are two there are two Sherlock Holmes. That's the, one of the things we we sort of extract in the exhibition. There is the updated Sherlock Holmes. So there's um, Rathbone in the wartime period, mm -hmm. you know, taking on the Nazis. 
there's the the latest Sherlock Benedict Cumberbatch you know it's very much in the present but it still is very Can faithful. Can you actually count the number of Sherlocks that have been or is it beyond? Um, it's well over, a hun- well over a hundred well, I mean when I was doing the research the only two characters that I could find that um, would would sort of compete in numerical terms was Dracula and Frankenstein. <laughs> Does anyone see a link there? Uh, this tension between the science and the paranormal that Susan was just alluding to, that's everywhere in Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? It pervades the account, and that's what makes him so much more than just a mystery solver. Yeah, we're we're a little bit naughty in the final section of the exhibition because we sort of we sort of take him apart, we dissect um, Sherlock Holmes, and we we do focus on his sort of analytical mind and his the sort of forensic, but there are other elements to his character which I I find um, quite appealing. He's also the master of disguise. You know, he loves dressing up and sneaking out into the streets of London and being hidden. And then there's the Bohemian, which is another wonderful characteristic. So I think the richness of this character is another uh, element of his... But that's, that's a direct reflection of Conan Doyle, isn't it? On one hand, you've got the medical man with a consulting detective who uses logic and has this brilliant deductive mind. On the other hand, a spiritualist who claims to speak to ghosts and I think uh, uh, also believed in fairies. Yes, I mean, you know... You look um, at me as if that was perfectly normal, and why am I asking? Um, Conan, Conan Doyle, right from quite early on in the 1880s, was interested in, in spiritualism. He attended uh, seances in South Sea, so he, right from the very early period he wa- was interested. But I think the science is much more prevalent in the early stories, and it begins to dissipate a bit towards in the 1920s and then he, he takes on more the sort of gothic in those in those very uh, very late stories it wasn't just Sherlock Holmes that he created I mean there's a story in my book about um, his, his role in the creation of the Marie Celeste legend in that um, everybody's heard of the Marie Celeste the ship that was found floating with its crew mysteriously disappeared well he before he was known as a writer wrote a, wrote a story that was published I think in one of the was it may have been Strand magazine Corn, or one of Cornhill I think Cornhill was, magazine yeah, yeah that basically created that legend, and he changed the name of Ma- um, Marie Celeste to Marie Celeste. And the key, um, the key thing in his fictional um, account of it was the fact that when the boarding party got onto the, onto the ship, the, um, the lifeboats were still there. And this story sort of filtered down through the ages, and there were still people 20, 30, 40 years later that were repeating the Marie Celeste legend as created by Conan Doyle. Even the government... Um, the Board of Trade, who were answering questions from people around the world about what happened to the crew, were using Arthur Conan Doyle's story rather than the original sort of investigative report that Gibraltar had produced. And in a way, that, that kind of backs up what I was, was going to say, which is that if, you, if you're writing fiction and you want to use the science uh, and you want to use cleverness of deduction, you have to remember that you're not starting with a mysterious circumstance that you have to elucidate. You're starting with the elucidation yes. and working back to the mysterious circumstance because you as the writer, you know what the answer is. You may know this particular forensic detail that's really clever and cunning and you figure out a mystery to go round the thing that you know already is clever and cunning, which makes your detective look incredibly clever. But in fact, you've just done it all by reasoning backwards. Um, Conan Doyle, I think, was also very clever in the way that he framed his stories. I mean, the best stories are the ones where Watson is telling you you're, you're, you're like Watson. You don't really understand everything, so you're, you've got this comfort zone. You're seeing the stories with the few stories which are told by Sherlock Holmes. They don't work quite so well. You need that frame, and I think with, you know, uh, skilled writers, that that often that frame is often the thing that. You know, our disbelief is sort of helped by that frame because we're we've got a comfort zone. We're looking through a sort of like a like a sort of frame into the into that uh, mysterious um, imaginary world. And how important is it whether we as readers can resolve the mystery, whether we have any hope of doing so or, or, or not? Very interesting that after the Sherlock tales, there's a whole kind of genre of, of almost rules. You know, here's a, here's a way, here's what you're allowed, and here's what you're you're not allowed. And there's a great one, I think, it was in about 1928: Twenty Commandments for Writing Detective Stories. The reader must have equal opportunity with the detective for solving the mystery. But that's broken all the time, isn't it? In Conan Doyle, occasionally throws up a complete googly that no one could deduce not yeah. even elementary yes i don't I, th- I think with the sherlock holmes stories um when we the readers are never going to really get it we're not going to um we're not going to get that you know right from the first few lines of the book we're not going to solve the mystery 
and it's only he's really something very very special he only can solve these very very complex problems that's why he's Sherlock and we're yes. just the reader Susan. I was just going, going wondering what Val thought um, I occasionally think which character would I really really love to have created what would I like to own um, and I do think Sherlock Holmes probably you know he is a masterpiece of, of literary creation all and all round don't you agree Val? I think so yes I mean he, and he captured her imagination in in a way with the the exoticism of his his life and and the intelligence apparent intelligence of his analytical reasoning even though as, as you said that they're not entirely fair there's very few of the Sherlock Holmes stories you could guess from the the, the story as it unfolds. I mean, the, the, the speckled band, why would you think of a, a, a poisonous snake introduced through the ventilation system? That's obviously the solution. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, but, but if you haven't read the speckled band by now, it's all over for you. Yeah. But, <laughs> but does that matter? I mean, do you, would you see that as a writer, as a, as a test? Should we be able to at least come most of the way on the journey, or are you allowed to throw up a, a lesser-known newt which somehow you know, well, managed to poison someone I think I think that in general people who read crime fiction tend to read a lot of it and they become very sophisticated readers they understand the sort of grammar of the storytelling if you like so when I'm writing I always work on the principle that by page 50 there will be somebody out there who's figured out where I'm going with this and my job as the writer is to make the journey worthwhile and that's in a sense what, what Conan Doyle did he made the journey worthwhile and it, sometimes the ending is almost irrelevant it's the fun you've had along the way what Alex was saying there about that sense of adventure being taken on Unless they demand their money back at yourself. page yeah. 50. Uh, Alex, one of the, the, the things that uh, leapt out for, for me, you know, reading around your exhibition is the extent to which sort of really London and Ed Edinburgh are the inspirations, like a, a lot of semi-literate Conan Doyle fans. I hadn't realised that he didn't know London all that well at all, so he manages to create this sort of third character from the aid of maps, really. When he was writing his first two stories, we know that he used a post office directory map to plot out the route that um, Sherlock Holmes and Watson took, especially through South, South London in the sign of the fall. But I think the later uh, short stories, he's beginning to get a bit more familiar because he's living in the 1890s in Norwood in South London. He's obviously commuting into the centre of town and a lot of those stories are based around the suburbs because the... It, that that's quite important, but I think generally um, the the world of two two one B Baker Street that that um, consulting room. There's something very comforting about that place. If you just close your eyes, you can still be back in that, and you're just you're waiting for the next. Um, well, it's almost like a patient actually. The next client to come into that room and it's still there and you if you were just looking out of the window you'd be looking down onto Baker Street and those elements might have come a bit from the filmic because we've again we've we've consumed so many different um, versions of that 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 set. Well, yeah, but I, but I have to say that I, I always felt um, when I was reading Sherlock Holmes when I was younger, and I suppose it was because the other city was more familiar to me, but it always seemed to me that, uh, that Conan Doyle's London, like the London of Jekyll and Hyde, was actually a thinly disguised Edinburgh. It seemed to, it chimed much more closely with me to the feel of, of of the Edinburgh old town contrasting with the new town than it than it did uh, with London, and I think that both of both of those writers kind of superimposed their Edinburgh on London as sort of palimpsest, and they, so you get this this atmosphere that I I find not quite London. It's not the London of Dickens. It's but it's a, it's a different place that has a sort of Edinburgh filtered through it. Susan? I was just going to move slightly away from Sherlock Holmes and ask David something that, that intrigues me. Um, his book is uh, consists of materials that's taken out of the National Archive, which gives it um, a seriousness and an importance, if you like, a stamp of... of um, what's the word? Can't think it's of it. It's officialdom. Officialdom. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Too early in the morning. Um... And yet, when you get into it, you know, the Loch Ness Monster, there isn't the Yeti, but there might well have been the Yeti. There are ghosts, there are all sorts of um, spaceships, things we don't believe in. Why are these hidden in some national archive? Uh, I mean, when clearly, mo not 
maybe not all of them, but most of them are just nonsense. Yeah, well, I came across uh, these these um, records while I was researching another book, a book on UFOs, of which there's there's mountains of material at the National Archives, and I, I just, you know, I came across this story about how during the Blitz that there was this police officer called Philip Terry that um, the Ministry of Home Security were using to find buried bodies, and they they obviously seriously took took his claims that he could use um, a, a hazel twig. And he was going out. Yeah. It, it, yeah, he was going out, and he was actually using this where you know where all the me- other methods had failed, and they couldn't explain it, and they were a bit worried about you know what was going on on here. But he was actually finding these buried bos- bodies under craters, you know. So you, so and and you also find the idea that um, although the you know obviously this is something that scientists cannot get their heads around that that during that sort of situation uh, you know when when they need that um, they, they need an advantage over the enemy that they will look at mysterious events and and don't don't forget these are just a drop in the ocean there must be lots and lots of other files that have not survived you've found really an enduring belief in the paranormal and you you've gone in it really almost like a folkloric expedition trying to explain the social and political world around that i mean the the example of the the angel of mons a a wartime legend which is is kind of explicable in soldiers who are on the edge of life and death looking for some form of redemption and the interesting thing about it is no one actually saw the angels of mons it was purely a story that was created by a writer called arthur macken from you might remind us of exactly when it was yeah this is in 1914 you know the very first battle of the first world war when the when the british the british expeditionary force were, were outnumbered facing a huge German army, and it seemed that they'd survived by a miracle. And it just so happened, a few weeks later, that this uh, the Welsh writer Arthur Macken, famous for his horror fiction, published a story in the London Evening News called uh, The Bowman, and it was all about how St George had appeared on the battlefield and brought a, a legion of, um, of a bowmen from Agincourt who rained arrows on the Germans, and people read this and believed it, that it must have happened, simply because of the, the lack of news from the front. And slowly, over six months, this became a legend. It turned into the Angels of Mons. The bowmen were replaced by angels. And, and Macken spent the rest of his life saying, I created this story, it was my story. So it's know, a bit there, like... are, there are stories like this. I, I don't know if you've read a book called The Third Man, which mm. is about people who have been, say, in dangerous mountain situations, um, or trekking across Antarctica or whatever, and have had... This this extraordinary sense that a third person is walking along beside them, helping them towards safety. And this is quite common uh, among what you would call very sane, rational people. Well, Shackleton had a similar experience on South Did Georgia, he? yeah, while he was cutting across the great glaciers, yeah. Some of those things, I guess, we could explain by the psychological condition of people at the time, not to say that they were remotely mm. bonkers, but that, that, that peculiar stresses Extreme and strains stress. uh, uh, push up peculiar responses but how hardy are these stories I mean, do, do facts ever get in the way can you ever disprove no. X-file material? No because the, the more you try and disprove them the more the people want to believe in them you know, <laughs> and maybe again, it's just this thing about it was being hardwired. But there's a fabulous detail I just loved on the, on the Loch Ness monster, and I think it, uh, there was a headline in the in the 1930s that it was not a legend but a fact, and that seemed to sort of harden it up. So then the media plays a role, and then a very tired-sounding official from the ministry says, "We are growing, we are growing a little tired of the Loch Ness monster. You know, please, can we stop this?" But but it doesn't stop it. It doesn't. And the interesting thing I found when going through the Loch Ness monster files was the fact that. Uh, 1933, when the, when the legend suddenly appeared on the national stage, it was the same year that King Kong was released, and people were, you know, seeing a giant ape man and, and and dinosaurs on screen. So there's got to be some relationship again. You're yeah. sounding somewhat sceptical, X file fans. Somewhat. X file <laughs> fans across the country might be jumping up and down and tweeting, saying, "Hey, but hang on, what about this? This has this has never been explained. That has never been done away with. Do you have any attraction to theories of the paranormal at all?" Well, strange things happen. They always have. But, um, you know, people will always come forward and say, ah, yes, you've explained this, but what about this one? You know, and, and you can you can never disprove everything, and that, that's not my role. But do, does our belief system change? I mean, we think of ourselves as rational people. We have an endless reporting of science, scientific breakthroughs. So why is it so resistant? Why are these paranormal beliefs so resistant well, to proof? As they found for these, this artwork that they found in Indonesia, you know, we are still the people that we were tens of thousands of years ago, so why should we not believe the same, same things we believe then? Val, you mentioned magic when you were talking about 
forensics earlier. Is that that seems to be part of the mix here, isn't it? That yeah, belief. I think we we want answers to the world around us, and when it puzzles us, we create answers. We we, cre- we create stories to fit the events that, that make a kind of sense to us. And that's you know, if you if you look historically, we we have done this since the mists of time. We have we've developed myths that explain all sorts of. of Phenomena that we can't explain at the time, and then eventually science well, comes along. Give me an example because you, you know our you know, appointed forensic boss for today. <laughs> give me an example of that borderline where forensics and magic, for want of a better word, coalesce. Well, if if you go back relatively recently, um, when we first started sending photographs to each other on on email as attachments, we'd send these photographs to each other, not having any sense that this was anything other than the same kind of photograph you would show someone round the dinner table, here's a picture of my grandchild, here's a picture from my holidays. Not understanding at all that these images that we sent to each other digitally contained information like what camera they had been taken on, the GPS Uh coordinates of where the photograph Uh had been taken, when it had been taken. So all sorts of data is embedded in this apparently simple image. And it is almost magical that suddenly from this, this, this digital file, someone can say, aha, you were standing on top of Mam Tor on the 23rd of December <laughs> when you took this photograph. You were not, in fact, in Yorkshire, as yes. you claimed. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes again. Yeah. I'll never fall for yeah. that one again. But yeah. is, that's funny, Alex, isn't it? Because that takes us right back to photography, the early days of photography, and that, the presence of the fairies at the bottom of the garden. The photograph as the carrier of myth or legend. Yeah, I think the... I mean, Conan Doyle... His, his his belief in both the uh, seances and the the spiritualism, the moving of tables, the bringing back of people from the dead, all that I think is wrapped up in two very disparate worlds. And I would think that he felt that in his Sherlock Holmes stories, he wasn't going to integrate that into those into that world. And the spiritualism side was something actually quite different for him. Susan. I was just intrigued by discussing the Loch Ness Monster that David mentioned purposeless ghosts. Well, of all the purposeless things, uh, the Loch Ness Monster. And oh, yet, you're harsh. I know. And yet it fascinates us, doesn't it? I was fascinated as a small child. Val, you're a Scot. Do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? It's a great job creation scheme. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the photographs? Talking to photographs. Well, there's photographs of UFOs, there's photographs of fairies. And, you know, you know, the, the camera, there's this idea that the camera doesn't lie, but really it's that every photograph tells a story is a more uh, appropriate phrase. Would it be possible, you're talking about impossible to disprove things, surely it might be possible to disprove the Loch Ness Monster? Well, I think even if you explored every single inch of the loch, you know, and drained all the water out of it, yeah. there'd still be people say, oh, well, it's, 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 it's migrated somewhere uh, else. To but actually, lock. what I did learn from reading about the, the Loch Ness Monster was the attachment to the legends of sea serpents. Oh, yes. Mm. And that that mm. was, as you, perhaps as you say, Susan, it sounds somewhat mm. purposeless now, but if you're in a context where tales about serpents and sea serpents are I mean, much more common currency... It's almost a natural extension as well as a job creation scheme. I think every lock in Scotland had a water kelp at one time or another. And and, and here we are in the eminently rational 21st century, a time of of referenda and thinking about what the new Scotland is and what's been the biggest work of public art in the last year in Scotland. Gigantic sculptures of water horses or kelpies that that loom up at you out of the landscape and scare the bejesus out of you if you're not expecting them. These are wonderful stories, aren't they? I was very upset when Richard Dawkins said children shouldn't be taught about unicorns because unicorns didn't exist. (laughs) We all know unicorns don't exist, but what magical stories stories. What child should be deprived of knowing about kelpies and mermaids and unicorns and all those magical creatures? In defense of unicorns. (laughs) Unicorns don't exist. Ah. You tell tell me unicorns don't exist. Ah, now you see, I can't prove this. You'll be telling me there's no Santa Claus next. (laughs) Shameful thought there. Uh, Says, what what do we make of supposedly real ghost stories? Because there's clearly there's a a link, isn't there, between what what David has researched, which are, if you like, the kind of official ones that we can enumerate, and then there are the ones of you know I saw my dead uncle. What 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 is really going on in them? What do you reckon to be the the psychological need for the ghost story? Well, the fiction writer always invents a reason for the ghost to be there. Of course, whether it's for revenge or whether it's to point where the hidden treasure is, whatever. But 
I've always applied the principle of Occam's razor to ghost stories. And 99.9%, let us say, of ghost stories, real ones, can be discounted because you could immediately say this is because tricks of light and whatever. But I have been told that 0.9% by sensible, sane people who were totally not likely to see a ghost, that I've thought there has got to be something in this because they've been almost embarrassed to tell it. And what was it? They don't believe it's a trick of light. They are absolutely convinced. Is that a response, David, that you come across? Because you've been right through the files, which must be... I I would just love reading all that official ease written about these bizarre events. Do you sometimes come across a a Humphrey or a Whitehall investigator who's actually more persuaded than we might expect? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't their function to do scientific investigations. You know, they will always sort of say, oh, well, you know, if we had time to look into this a bit further. But we yeah, but which, which ones do you think really sort of captured the imagination of the, the, the man in the suit who gets the file on well, his desk? There's, there's one um, where the uh, it was a house um, in London. I can't remember the district of London, but it was a house that was... That was so fires were breaking out all over the place, and the, the family was so scared by this ghost that used to appear out of the wardrobe that they, they decamped into the garden. And the London Fire Brigade, of all, of all people, did an investigation of this and said, you know, we've been called out, you know, numerous times and have been unable to find the source of the fire. And it was this, 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 um, this went actually to a rent tribunal because the family wanted to get the rent reduced as a result of the haunting. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, something was going on there. You know, they, they, they weren't setting fire to their own house. But, but what? The forensic, there's our desire quickly for forensics, but also a kind of spiritual aspect. Well, that seems to drive readers across the centuries. Yeah, I think people want want answers. Ultimately, it comes back to this thing of we're curious. We're curious animals. We want to know the why. All the time, we want to know the why. It's why we go to science. It's why we go to fiction. It's why we go to art. Well, there we must leave our ghoulies, ghosties, long-legged beasties and murder mysteries. Val McDermott, whose latest book is Forensics, The Anatomy of Crime, was with me this morning. Susan Hill and her new ghost story is Printer's Devil Court. Alex Werner, head of the history collections at the Museum of London with a new Sherlock Holmes exhibition, The Man Who Never Lived and Will Never Die. There's a book out with the same title. David Clark, lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University, author of Britain's Extraordinary Files. More Sherlock Holmes on BBC4 Extra from next week, stirring dramas from the archive and next Monday Tom Sutcliffe will be discussing Napoleon with Andrew Roberts and Jenny Uglow but for now thank you and a ghostly goodbye thank you for listening and you can get more podcasts from the BBC Radio 4 website the the relationship reader have with the characters the technology, the science is only ever at the service of the story if you fall in love with the science and make the book about the science it dates very quickly because particularly at the moment the science is moving forward so quickly But then isn't it tempting to set your books further back when you don't have so much of a a problem with all these nifty forensic scientists and brilliant entomologists working out exactly which which beetles turned up when And it is the case that the the history mystery has has really uh, risen to the to, to great preeminence in recent years. Many, many more people are writing their books set in the era before we had any respectable forensic science at all. And there's quite a few of us who are also using the, the idea of the cold case investigation, applying contemporary forensics to cases that were intractable at the time when they first occurred. Susan, the difference, I suppose, with that form of mystery writing and the ghost story, or one of the genres in which you specialise, is that generally with a ghost story, we, we know who did it, or roughly who did it, but it's the implication that matters and the consequence, isn't it? Yes, and it's not just who did it, um, as, as Val was saying about crime, it's not, not the who, it's the why. Um, the why is the most interesting fact of all, I think. Um, with ghosts, ghosts are quite different. But it's interesting that I was, um, as I was listening to, to Val, I was remembering being on this programme a couple of years ago um, with a physicist from my old college, King's in London, who was working on, uh, oh, some abstruse area of physics to do with materials and how they um, are made and unmade. And I, I don't know the science. Um, I came across, con- had conversations with forensic scientists uh, where what they were telling me seemed almost like magic. Often it's because we don't really know the si- enough about the science as lay people. But sometimes even when you know a bit about the science, it does seem extraordinary, like magic. So I guess in that sense, we've become much more competent at analysing the material that you find at a crime scene. So we expect 
consequently that much more from the scientists. You do make it sound very, well, forensic, but reading your book, I, I was struck by the fact that you have to accept a good deal of the grisly in with the science in order to really want to know about it. Uh, I now know, for instance, that maggots can uh, devour a human corpse, I think 60% of a human corpse, in an incredibly short space of time. So you have to really be prepared to get into that nitty-gritty. And What is it that attracts you to that? Well, I think if you're interested in why we commit the kind of crimes we commit, uh, I think one also wants to be able to figure out how we explain those crimes and how we at least solve them and then make it possible to explain why we commit these things. So in order to solve them, you have to be willing to engage with the raw material, if you like, and the raw material is, by definition, often very grisly. And, and very insect-based as well. We, we do get to know <laughs> I, I didn't an know awful much lot about entomology, which I, is I, a I new specialism after reading your book. I didn't know much about entomology when I, I started working on the book. I mean, I knew that there was the science of forensic entomology and I knew it was uh, important in laying down parameters of, of time of death. But I had no idea the, the complexities and the extent of it and the fascination of it indeed. Uh, until I met Martin Hall at the Natural History Museum, who is a man with huge... And as he was talking, I said something like, well, what about ghosts? And he said, oh, ghosts. Ghosts are absolutely fascinating, because it's perfectly possible. And there was a very, very um, rationalist, a scientist, saying, oh, yes, and time, and what's all that? And I found that very exciting. Very reassuring for someone very who writes stories. Uh, uh, yeah, stories. absolutely. Yes, it isn't like crime. I mean, but do you like the ghost story because forensics don't largely figure? Yes, you don't have to go there. No, no, no. It's it's fa exactly it's fantasy, really. It's fantasy and it's fun. Um, and I know the only the serious part of writing the ghost story is that I want to know why, if there is such a thing as a ghost, why it's there. And most real ghost stories, as it were, um, are rather uninteresting because there seems to be no reason why they should float up and down these staircases. I think we might revisit your spectres in, in, in a moment. Alex, how advanced was forensic science when Arthur Conan Doyle was writing his oh, little-known Sherlock Holmes stories? Um, well, it was just beginning, really, then. Uh, the Metropolitan Police Force in London had been established, but they weren't that good at solving crime. And I think um, Conan Doyle um, saw a gap in the market because he was a medic, so he had a good understanding of sort of scientific techniques, and he had a sort of uh, sort of eureka moment, I think, when he realised that he could bring his um, scientific background to meld it into the detective and it was something quite new. Thank you for downloading this edition of Start the Week with me, Anne McElvoy. Hello, we're a rational bunch here on Start the Week, did you ever doubt it? But from the creep of yellow fog in a Victorian thriller to a pulsating light in the evening sky unaccounted for by the Met Office, many of us thrill to the chill of the unexplained. The appetite for ghost stories and grisly murder mysteries persists, despite all those newfangled experts who can explain at least most paranormal and homicidal goings-on. So, around the table, in a seance-like formation, as it happens, I have four people who deal with the downright disturbing as part of the day job. Val McDermott is writer of crime fiction and a new non-fiction book, Forensics, The Anatomy of Crime. Susan Hill is the best-selling author of a wide range of books, including ghost stories such as The Woman in Black and now Printer's Devil Court. Alex Werner is Head of History Collections at the Museum of London, which has a new Sherlock Holmes exhibition, The Man Who Never Lived and Will Never Die. And David Clark is Journalism Lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University and author of Britain's Extraordinary Files. Val, when it comes to crime fiction and often to real crime, we seem to expect forensic science to have the answers. Is that what you found as you researched your book? I think the, the the obvious answer is, in a sense, yes, because the, the the science has moved forward tremendously in the last 25 years. Uh, every week, it seems, there's new developments in one branch or another of forensic science that renders explicable that which was inexplicable. It, it renders uh, analysable that which was previously a mystery. Often, uh, while I was researching this book, I, I had a passion for its subject. Who follows clues through the, the behaviour of insects around mm. dead bodies. There's also some showmanship involved here, though, isn't there? It, it lends itself to a, a kind of drama. There's an early example from China of 
Well, you, you tell us. Well, this is, this is actually one of the earliest uh, examples we know of forensic science. And it was a handbook that was produced for coroners in China in the 12th century. And one of the case studies in the book uh, involved the, the, a, a man being murdered. Uh, it was fairly evident quite quickly that the murder weapon was a sickle. The coroner could tell this from the, the shape and angle of the cuts. Um, but nobody knew who had committed the murder. So the, the coroner got every man in the village who possessed a sickle to, to line up, put their sickle down in front of them. And as he watched, uh, a fly came along and settled on the blade of one of the sickles. And then other flies joined it. So mm. there was a veritable buzzing cloud of the kind of flies that are attracted by dead bodies. So although the murderer had attempted to cover up his crime by washing his sickle, the traces were still there enough the for a fly. They can smell things at an extraordinary distance. When you handle forensic science in your fiction, I suppose, especially knowing what you know now, what are the challenges of, of doing that so that it's credible but do, just doesn't lead you into a long string of kind of regressive science that only the very informed could follow? Well, I think what you have to always remember when you're writing fiction, that the technology has to be at the service of the story. In a, in a, in a novel, it's the characters who, who drive the story and... and the tension of the story has to, has to go with 